ask that you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 49 through 53. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 49. And I'll just remind you as you're turning over there, this is one long series that started in 12.1, and Jesus preached all the way through chapter 13, verse 9. Okay, so if you want to read in its completion, that's what you have to go through. Starting in verse 49, we're talking about the provocative Christ, and I think you'll see that in this passage. In verse 49, it says, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it's accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. From now on, five and one house will be divided against three, and three against two, and two against three. Father will divide, be divided against son, and son against father. Mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Let's pray. Father, as we come to this time this morning, uh, we've got so much to be thankful for. We remember during this season that you not only gave your only son, but he came he died on a cross. And it didn't just end there, Lord. We understand that He arose. Father, we thank You for the saints that are right now in glory with Him and those that will be joining Him at some time in the future. And Father, we ask that You continue to add to that number. For we never come in here and proclaim Your Gospel, Your truth, without hoping that lives are changed and people are saved. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the consistency. Thank You for the truths that are timeless. I pray that we would understand them as we go through them today. I ask that Your Holy Spirit would fill Your saints, and Your saints would recognize, and those that don't know would be convicted and come to know You. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been doing so good. We're going to do it again. And then we will go through for the guests that are in here. Church, what does Luke 13, 24 say? Alright, they're going to pop it up on the screen for those that are visitors. If you would say it one more time, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able to. If I were to ask the congregation to picture Jesus, most people would conjure up the same image. I mean, if I just started there and I said, you imagine Jesus, most of us immediately have a picture that pops into our head. I will dub this Jesus Caucasian Jesus. Okay? Caucasian Jesus is the person that we see on the screen today. He has fair skin and blue eyes. His hair is perfectly feathered. He's got a little lamb tucked up under his arm. And as he walks around, dirt nearly gets near him. It doesn't stay in his garments. As a matter of fact, it really doesn't touch him. We see him as meek. And gentle, we see him as a person that would not hurt a fly. We see him as a person that only left footprints in the sand so that we can have a poem to hang up on our walls. That's the Jesus that we see in this picture. This Jesus is not confrontational at all. And for many, this is how you were taught. This is how you would see Jesus. And if I said otherwise, it would provoke you. 
Some people it would be provoking you to understanding and others to anger. But one way or another it would provoke you. During the 60s and 70s, we had another Jesus. This was hip, hippie Jesus. You remember him? <laughs> hippie Jesus was one that came on the scene and he actually changed a lot in the evangelical world. He put his stamp on the people teaching them untrue doctrines. But if we looked at him, we'd see a man with long flowing robes and he had these rose-colored glasses and flowers in his hair. He even had this nice tie-dyed sash that he'd wear, and he preached love to everyone and seemed at first to be this bridge in humanity. Anybody could cross over. He was trying to bring all people together, and that meant that if he had to go get his VW van and pick somebody up, he'd do it. This Jesus, when you start to dig in, was really somebody that lowered the moral standards in our society, inviting people to do things and live in a debased, depraved nature like never before seen in America. And it was sold under the context of love. Now, in certain places, if I attempted to describe him any differently, of course, it would provoke a response. And I'm sure whenever I describe this kind of Jesus before you today, it does provoke you to some extent. And rightly it should. In the past 20 years, another Jesus showed up. We refer to him as Hipster Jesus. Now, Hipster Jesus has a perfectly manicured goatee. He's got a little soul patch in an island. I mean, he does everything in a way that people gravitate toward him because he's the likable guy and he says all the right things at the right, thing, at the right time. He's just cool in the way that he presents himself. He's very similar to Hippie Jesus in that he will only live up to or apply certain doctrines in his life. He has a love that he describes as being no, uh, having no boundaries. It's just love for everybody. He wants everybody to be together. And he ascribes to the metaphor of the mountain. I don't know if you've ever heard this before. But there are people climbing this large mountain and one comes up on this side and another on this side, but eventually they're just going to summit at the same place. And what they're saying by that is the hipster Jesus says, I'm a way, but I'm not the way. And if you need to go through another religion, that'd be fine because I'm cool with it. This Jesus also drops doctrine. He drops important doctrines. He doesn't like to talk. It's offensive about the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. He doesn't like to talk about sin because that's hurtful and it gets people angry. And we don't want to ruffle any feathers unnecessarily. Even if we're speaking truth, we don't want that to happen. So hipster Jesus pushes people to shy away from that altogether. And then he's going to preach heaven in the absence of hell. You can have heaven and you can go in glory and you can live your life however you want to because you don't have to worry there's not really a hell. That's hipster Jesus. He deletes anything that's uncomfortable so that we can all, quote, get along. Do you see how that description might provoke some people? And lastly, who can forget Fabio Jesus? <laughs> this perversion of Jesus fits right in with the Dan Brown concept of a holy God-man that took on flesh and he seduced a cadre of women 
That when he gets close to them, they swoon. He is an Adonis that winks at them and they fall down. He has even gone as far to seduce Mary Magdalene. He had a secret wife and girlfriend and there's a whole group, a whole line of people that have come down from this man. And many people within the church bought into this heresy. This guy seems to be smooth. And, you know, if you watch the movies that he was portrayed in, they get a lot of the theology right. And so the church is going, Woo, we love this. We've got a movie where he's getting a lot of it right. But let me tell you what else he does. When the storyline doesn't work out the way that he wants to, he alters it. He changes details in there so that Hollywood can have more flash and he's more exciting than seeing the discipline of God and the justice that needs to come out from him as well. He's not the Jesus that we see in the Bible. He wakes up and he looks like he hasn't slept at all, but he's been levitating above his bed so that he didn't muss his gorgeous locks. Even to the point where after the crucifixion, he had some blood on him, but he just shed that. It was just a little spattering. He didn't want to mess up his silk robes. Can you see how that description might provoke somebody? If I'm honest, those descriptions provoke me. Why? Because they don't even come close to describing the Jesus that we see on the pages of Scripture. In this world, there are only two kinds of people. There are those who desire a different Jesus than the one on the pages of Scripture. And there are those who want the real thing. On either side, people are provoked, so why not just choose the real deal? You already know somebody's not going to be happy about it, amen? The biblical Jesus was gentle, and he was tough, and he was kind, and he was comely, he was poor in material possessions, and he was rich towards God. He was brilliant, insightful, passionate, powerful, angry, sad, and I would even wager to say we see this very clearly on the pages of Scripture that Jesus was sarcastic at times, and I can identify with that. I say all that while knowing that I haven't even scratched the surface when it comes to the real Jesus. So the question is, why would people feel the need to change who He is? Why do people describe Jesus in a different way, in a different light? Really, I don't think that there's just one answer. Some people are ignorant of Jesus. They're ignorant of who He is. They haven't learned that much in church. They haven't learned that much from others. They see Him described in a way that the Bible doesn't describe, and they've taken that to heart. They believe some of the information about Him, but not all of it. Still others don't like that the Bible describes a jealous God. They resort to idolatry to fix their problem with the God that's presented. And beyond that, we have people that are in cults. And they grew up hearing about a guy named Jesus, but it's not the same one we see described on the pages of Scripture. The Jesus that we're going to see today is rarely talked about. He's divisive and pushes people to make decisions. Today, if we were to use our cultural vocabulary, I believe that we would literally say that the Jesus that we see today is unkind and mean. If we used our context of culture today. To be honest with you, I see a different shade of love. He's the man that no one else could be. He's the man that no one else would be. The Jesus we'll see today didn't mind if he irritated or provoked. He just wanted people to hear his message. I purposefully titled this message, 
the provocative Christ. And I use the word Christ because it comes from the Greek word Christos, which means anointed one. Okay? He was the anointed one to bring salvation. And some people would accept it and some people would reject it, but he would provoke people one way or another. He is the provocative Christ. And that definition stands to this day. This morning I have a question for you. Do you believe in the provocative Christ of the Bible or do you believe in some other version? I say we find out together as we go through this passage because I believe it's going to be a dividing line for some people in the church. Luke used this passage to describe our Savior as someone who was willing to righteously provoke people to get a saving response. This morning I only have one point for you and we'll work on the next two next week. The first one says, Jesus provokes div division. Now, if you read through this passage, you'll see that that aptly talks about what he did in this time. Jesus provokes division. To put this in context, you have to look back at verse 48. Verse 48 says, For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask more. Now, Jesus had just finished talking about the faithful servant, and this is what we went through last week. The faithful servant was described as the one that did two things. There were two things alone that he did. It. He would watch, and if he was going to watch, he did so by having his candle lit, making sure that it stayed lit. He would trim the wick, and when the light started to go down, he would replenish the lamp with oil to make sure that it didn't go out and he was waiting and he was watching for the master to show up because he knew that he would show up in a moment when people least expected him to come. Now that's a faithful servant. That's the first part of it. It's a 50-50 deal. The first 50% means that the person is watching and waiting for Jesus Christ. And there are people in this church today, and I've heard it, and I said it last week, I'll say it again. You're waiting for Jesus to come, and you say, come, Lord Jesus, come. It's just like you want Him to show up today. And then there are another group within the same ranks, in the same building, when we literally talk about Jesus showing up, it terrifies you. You know what? That's okay. Just don't be the people that are trying to be in the middle. Let it scare you or let it cause you to rejoice. Don't be the people that it says it just doesn't matter. Because it absolutely does. At least if it scares you. The fear of the Lord is in you and you're moving in the right direction. The other thing that the Lord asked us to do was work. Work. And there was a servant that was a steward in the house. The steward was over the rest of the slaves and the steward would delegate responsibilities. He would feed them at the appropriate time. He made sure that house management was taken care of the way that it needed to. He was faithful, according to the passage of Scripture, which meant he was reliable. How many of you like reliable people? Hey, Amen. Great. Praise God. He, he, Jesus is looking for those faithful, those reliable people that are working. And He said you also had to be wise. Now that word wise best described as a person that's discreet. So you'll do something in the work of the Lord, not expecting for people to pat you on the back. Because we're waiting for Jesus to come back, and He'll do that Himself. The Scripture itself says that Jesus is going to arrive. He's going to rapture the church home if we don't die before He gets back for us. And He's going to take us, and He will serve us. I don't even get it. I, mean, I understand it, but you know what I'm saying? At the same time, it's hard to imagine that the Savior of the universe that went through what He went through is going to come back, rapture His home, uh, put us in a position where He's going to serve us and be with us throughout eternity. I, it just blows my mind. So your responsibility is to be a person that is sitting there watching and working until He comes to work is defined as this, and I'll move on from this after this. If you're really working, if you're really working, 
That means you're willing to share the gospel with the people in your circles. Say, so, Pastor, I thought it was about um, collecting cans. We do that to do good works. That's the thing that we do as Christians. Amen. You've been saved and you do some good works. We bandaged people up. We had a great time when we came in here and we learned about CPR and other things like that. That's something that's needed in the church to take care of the people. But folks, the one thing that defines the worker is a person that shares the gospel. You're waiting and you're working faithfully to share with the people around you because we don't know how much time we've got. And he could show up at any minute. Although you could be the unfaithful servant that he described at the end of the passage and he said, if I show up and you're beating the servants and getting drunk and living a debauched life, then the very thing that I'm going to do to you is cut you in half. I'm going to send you to hell is really what the analogy comes out to. And depending on how bad you've been, it's going to be worse for you when you arrive in the flames of hell. Now that's not light. <laughs> that's not light and it sets the framework for what he tells us today. He's saying, yes, it's going to cost you. Yes, you're going to have to work. Yes, you need to be watching, but you will be rewarded. On the other hand, if you're not, you're going to be like the crowd that was tripping over themselves. It's what Scripture describes. They were stepping on top of each other to get closer to Christ. They're doing whatever they could to be near Him. And then He launches in to a section on division. Even though Jesus isn't often portrayed this way, His presence has always pro provoked division. In verse 49, He said, I came to send fire on earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Upon hearing that, many people, even Christian people, get confused. They get confused because that doesn't seem to fit what they've always been told. They'll say, well, Jesus came to die on the cross for our sins, for the sins of the world. And they would be right in that, but that's at best incomplete. He did come to die for the sins of those who would believe, but at best that is incomplete. He also came to expose the rebellion of humanity. When God stepped out of glory itself, when He stepped out of heaven and He took on flesh, He arrived as Savior and Judge at the same time. He arrived as Savior and Judge. He was either accepted as Savior unto salvation or rejected as a Judge unto condemnation. Jesus always provoked people to either receive Him as Savior or judge, there's never been a third option. Hey guys, if I need to come back there, I'll separate you. Okay? He always had to be one of the two. This is one of the most serious subjects that we'll talk about in here any time. People are going to receive Jesus as Savior or judge. Now, what I'm about to go through in this scripture, I'm going to tell you how to take notes on. I battled with whether or not I was going to do it this way. Okay? I am not trying to confuse. I'm trying to preach the Word of God in a way that you can understand it. So when I approach what I'm about to do with you, I said, I've got to come up with a way that they can take notes and understand at the same time. Because I'm going to be reading scriptures about 15. And I apologize for going through this list, but I think you're going to see why I'm doing it this way. As we go through this scripture, here's how you take notes. Write down the reference. Okay? Write down the reference, and then you're going to write S for what? Savior. Savior and you're going to write J for what? Judge. S for what? Savior. J for what? Judge. Okay, now we're doing this for a reason, because you're going to see Jesus depicted in one of these two ways as we go through these. Anytime in Scripture you hear the Lord say, I have come, or I came, He's making a declarative statement about His mission. Okay? He, he's telling you, this is why I came. And it affects people in one of the two ways that we just described. He will either be Savior 
or judge. In Matthew 5.17, I think this is one of the most difficult ones to start with, but I went in a biblical order. Matthew 5.17, you're familiar with it. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So which category did he fall into, Savior or judge? Savior here. Okay? We see him coming as Savior. He did what no one else could. Let me ask you a question. Could you fulfill the law? We had to have him do it, didn't we? So Jesus came as Savior in this passage. In Matthew 10, 34, he says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Which one? Judge. Judge. That's absolutely it. That's what we see when we read this passage. He was saying that he was judged. He was still on the same mission. But he was a judge at this point for some people that would reject him. In Mark 138, he said to them, Let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. Savior, you're getting it. Oh, I love it. Perfect. All right. I shouldn't put this one up on the screen or it might already be there. It is. All right, Luke 5.32. Y'all should know this one well. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. I'm hearing a mix. Okay, it's both. It's both, right? I didn't come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. He works himself out there as being both Savior and Judge. In Luke 9.56, this is another one of our scriptures here that we've done. Luke 9.56, For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Savior. That one's pretty obvious there. In Luke 13.7, and he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? Judge. Judge. And right here he's specifically talking about Israel. You can go back and look at the context of what's going on. They're rejecting him and he's saying, I'm going to bring fire. Let's go ahead and throw this tree, Israel, into the fire. Luke 13, 7. He said, to, oh, sorry, Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man has, not, has come to seek and save that which was lost. Savior. In John 5, 43. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. What do you think? He's a judge here. Because he was unwelcomed as a savior. Okay? You can go back and read the references for yourself. In John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. It's savior and it's judge. Because people are going to receive it one way or another. In John 9, 39, And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world so that those who do not see may see and that those who see may become blind. Savior and judge. He's like, I want some of you to see, and some of you aren't going to see, and you're going to be blind. He's both Savior and judge in this passage. In John 10.10, 10, y'all know this one. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. What is he there? Savior. In John 12, 26 through 28, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Here he is treated as the Savior because he's doing, doing what only a Savior could do. He's doing what only a Savior could possibly do. we got two more. In John 12, 46 and 47, I have come 
as light into the world. Don't let this confuse you. I'll explain it. So that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Now, if Jesus came preaching the good news and people didn't accept that good news, what would he automatically be? So he's not contradicting anything here. The people that accepted him as Savior got the good news. And those by default that rejected him were treated by the judge himself. He's either rejected or accepted. Last one in John 18, 37. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born... And for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. I think it's both. I think he's here as Savior and by default again is judge. You go back and you'll look at them, but it's going to divide out in one of these two ways as you go through this. So the appearing of Jesus, he was either accepted or rejected. He was seen as Savior or judge of the world. So when we see him reacting in a different way like he is today, we need to expect that that's a part of his character. The nature of God never changes. That's something our society really needs to get. The nature of God never changes. Here we go, the nature of Jesus never changed. Just as the Father desires to eradicate sin from this gross, debauched world, the Son did also. But what we must understand is, if He didn't choose to come to this world and hang on the cross as a substitute, absorb the wrath of God, we never would have been given the salvation that He offered. He had to stick to the mission. If He would have come to this world and started judging sin like He had every right to do, if he would have executed those judgments on the people of the world, everybody would have been wiped out. But in the forbearance of God, he took his time. He didn't do what he immediately could have done to us when he came. He came as Savior. Some accepted and some rejected him. If he didn't come as the suffering Savior, then he would have come as the just judge. And folks, I can tell you, none of us would have wanted that. When it comes to the Word of God, I'm a literalist. So when Jesus says He came to send fire on the earth, that's what I believe He came to do. The eternal character of God determined that He would completely wipe out all life using two elements here on this earth. Okay, One of them we know right off the bat. We, we get it. We remember the time where Noah had a flood and it was worldwide and it came and it wiped out everything, every tree, plant, everything that was around the world was submerged in water. The animals died except those, save those that were on the ark, a boat that was built by supernatural design, sealed by God himself, which I believe is the only reason that it held up the way that it did in 40 days. And when it was all said and done, all of the life on earth had been killed except for the animals on the boat and the eight people that were inside. God chose one element at first, being water, to wipe this planet out. The second time, he's going to use fire. Look at 2 Peter 3.10. I'm going to have it on the screen. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with an intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Here fire is used to purify all sin. You say, what's all sin? Why didn't he just burn up the earth? Well, when Adam sinned, all of creation was plunged into the darkness and depravity of sin. Everything around, animals, people, plants, everything that we have, even the oxygen that we breathe has been affected by sin. And God said one day, which hasn't happened yet, we know that because we're still here, he's going to come back, and the second great destruction that we see is him burning everything up with fire. The universe, the material universe, is going to be destroyed by God in one large fire. 
So first he came by water. The second time he came by fire, but the big difference between the two is one reshaped the world and the other one is going to erase it altogether. Second time when he comes, he's not going to deal with any more sin. Nothing is going to be left. It's hard for us to imagine Jesus, especially the one that we grew up with, getting to that point. But he even said that he wished that the fire was already kindled. I want to ask you a question before I move out from here. If you're building a fire, what do you throw on it first? A little wood, a little small kindling? What do you think that the kindling is that he's talking about here? It's the lost that are going to stand before him at the great white throne judgment. Satan himself, the false prophet and the beast. He's looking out at the world. He's looking out at a bunch of people that have had every opportunity in the world to respond to him. You think about that. He's, Jesus, the master teacher, is there in front of them, and they could have responded to him and followed him as Savior and Lord, yet they rejected him, they mocked him, and ultimately they crucified him. He's looking at all these people that he's been preaching to for about three years at this point, and he's saying, haven't you gotten it yet? I mean, come on, haven't you gotten it yet? Three years I've been preaching. I, I, I set up my base of operations in Capernaum, and they heard. And yet there are so many people to this day that will not turn to me and they've been given more of an opportunity than the world has ever seen up to this point. They, they won't come to me. Why won't they come to me? He said, I, I'm looking out here and how I wish the fire was already kindled. Did Jesus, did God have the right to have this holy anger and indignation? Absolutely he did. Because it is equivalent with the character of God. And his soul, his person, never changes. The Godhead has never been altered one step, one iota. You know, there's something in us where we understand that today. We have been created in the marred image and likeness of God. There was one man that was created in the image and likeness of God, and his name was Adam. Okay? Since then, we've been born in the likeness of man, and we're a marred image and likeness of God himself. But I think that there's something in our humanity that still remembers the right thing to do. What we need to see happen. Some of you are going to identify with this immediately, you're walking past a piece of trash. It may be around your house. Usually it's out in front where somebody drove by and went. You know, because that's their trash can. The world's trash can are our streets. But you walk past it, and you have this urge to reach down and pick it up. How many of you have been driving yellow cars around for the past couple weeks? You just want to take a hose and just... Rinse it off. This is within us. You want to fix the problem there. Jesus is standing before this great crowd. And even though he loves them and he came to die for them, he's still saying, man, how I wish the fire was already kindled. Let's go ahead and fix this. I believe that people don't really want to live in filth, even if they're drowning in it. Jesus is perfection itself, and he wants to recreate the heavens. He wants to recreate the earth without even the thought of sin remaining. Does that make sense to you, why he would have said that? Why he would have wanted to kindle that fire? Even though Jesus desired to purge the universe of, uh, the universe of sin, he still knew that the best way to accomplish it was through the predetermined plan of the Father. In verse 50 he says, But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it's accomplished. Here when we look at this, baptism is used metaphorically for judgment. That's 
what he's saying. It's used metaphorically for judgment. Jesus had already been baptized in the Jordan River a couple of years ago as an example to us, and that's not what he's talking about here. The term baptism was used by the Jews to describe anything that overwhelms, anything that consumes. I'll give you a couple of quick, quick examples. A ship that's on rocky seas can be consumed with waves, okay? You can have a person that picks up a bottle and gets drunk and they get consumed with alcohol. You can have a scholar that's studying and as he studies he gets consumed with questions. It's anything that overwhelms and that's the picture that you need to get when Jesus is talking about baptism here. The baptism that he was going to have to endure was a baptism of suffering unto justice. He was going to have to endure that on the cross. Jesus is giving us a picture of how he suffered on the cross. And I'm going to take this a step further so that you can understand that he was immersed in divine suffering. When a person is baptized, we duck them under water. Okay? When Jesus was baptized on the cross, that's the baptism that he's talking about, being there hanging on the cross absorbing the wrath of God. He was literally our propitiation. The picture that he wants you to get is one of baptism. Why does he want us to get this picture of baptism? Why did he take it this far? Here's what he wants you to see. For every person that he died for, for the millions and millions that he went to the cross for, Jesus was being baptized. It's a picture of him being baptized into the lake of fire because he absorbed all the wrath that would have been put on those people while he was on the cross. Can you imagine enduring that on the cross? The physical torture was nothing up to this point. When God loosened his grip and forsook the Son and the wrath was poured out on him, it was like nothing the world would ever experience. The physical torture didn't even come close. He said, I've got a baptism to go through and how distressed I am till this whole thing is over with. Folks, when someone undergoes the ordinance of baptism, they're praising Jesus for the death, burial, and resurrection that he made possible through the cross. When they're submerged, that represents the wrath that Jesus endured for them. Baptism means way more than being able to join the church. Did you hear me on that one? <laughs> it means way more than just being able to join the church. It symbolizes what he experienced on your behalf. I hope that weighs on you a little bit more like it did on me. It's obvious that Jesus didn't look forward to that baptism. He even said that he would be distressed until it was accomplished. The word distress means that a person is seized or grabbed by something. Do you remember when Jesus... Uh, crossed over the Sea of Galilee. He gets over to the other side, and Legion runs up to him. He's got a buddy with him, but we'll focus on Legion. He eventually ends up casting out the thousand demons that's inside of Legion, and they go into a herd of swine. Do you remember that picture? While that was happening, the people of the area were standing there watching. And it says, as the demons went into the pigs, they careened over the cliff and went into the water and they drowned and they were seized with fear. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's been seized by this. And it's not something that he's going to get away from. Later, when Jesus was being dragged off to trial, when they took him away, he was seized. They literally grabbed him and pulled him away. Now, Jesus did have the choice, but he gave in. Amen? He gave in and he went. But he went. He was seized by the people and grabbed away. Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verses 23 and 24, that he's pressed in on all sides. He has the desire to depart and be with Christ and also to remain and be in ministry. He's being seized in between two worlds. What Jesus was saying here is he was enduring the seizing the agony that he'd have to go through for us and how much he wanted it to be accomplished, we can't even measure in words. He just wanted it to be over with. I believe it was always in the back of his mind. Jesus understood that he must die in order to offer the world salvation, but that didn't soothe his hatred for sin. 
God hates sin. Go and look at Proverbs 6. In verse 51, he said, Do you suppose that I came to give peace on the earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. Is that a different Jesus, a provocative Jesus, than the one that we've seen in the past? He says, I came to bring division. Every Christmas, since I can remember, any time in my life, I've been surrounded by some sort of celebration of Jesus Christ and his birth. Does anybody else fall into that category? A lot of us have. We've grown up around it. And without a doubt, without fail, I'll hear this read on Christmas morning or in some celebration. It comes from Luke 2, 14. And you know the verse. It says, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward God. Man. Now, if that poor translation stands, <laughs> then Luke 12, 51 doesn't make a lot of sense. It says, do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. We just read one where it sounds like Jesus is saying, I came to bring peace. These two verses are in direct opposition. But here's what I've learned over the years of study. Jesus is never inconsistent. The Bible is never inconsistent. Any truth he declares always stands. In Luke 2.14, it should have been translated like this. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace toward men of goodwill. That fits a lot better with what we've been talking about today. Even the NASB in 2.14 says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Do you see it? Jesus had to be Savior or Judge, and if you rejected him as Savior, he's going to be the Judge in your life. And you experience the same exact thing in your life today. If you share the gospel and you get rejected by somebody, they don't want to hear it, they'll immediately say, why are you judging me? And I look at them, I say, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just delivering the message that God gave me. But folks, you end up being like the judge at the same time. Have you ever noticed that it's not hard to get along with true followers of God. That's one way that I see the church united is when they're getting along. That's the way it's always meant to be. But even among the church, we know that there are people that are still lost and they genuinely fight against and believe a different way than the church and they can't understand how they would have this standpoint and you would have that standpoint and there seems to be a lot of division in the church today and somebody stands up and says, why can't there just be peace? Why can't there just be peace? I've heard on more than one occasion somebody say, all right, there should just be one church. There's no reason for there being more than one denomination. If you've studied church history at all, if you understand scripture, you understand that right now during this time there has to be division in the church. Has to be. There's no way to get around it. You could start something out perfect and holy and true and righteous and doing it exactly the way that God planned. Somewhere down the road, somebody's going to trip up, fall into sin, start doing things in a way that's completely ungodly and take you down a path that you don't need to go to. And the only way that you can fix it is to reset. You've got to start over. You've got to get back in there and say, well, they're doing it this way. We're going to have to go over here because this is what the Word of God has to say. It's going to cause division. Jesus provokes division. There's no way to get around that. You say, well, I still don't go with you. I'll go back to an example that I've already used. When the world would no longer do what God had asked them to do, he said, I'll flood the place. It's the only way to fix it. I'm going to flood it. Spirit will not always strive with man. He will not always strive with the flesh. And when sin becomes the dominant motif of life, God said, that's enough, and he sent a flood. 
And later on, he's talking to Moses, and they had rebelled once again against his divine authority, and he looks at Moses, he said, Moses, how about you? I'll take you, and we'll just start over with you. Is the nature of the Father and the nature of the Son different? No. No. Sometimes when you live for Christ, if you've got Christ within you, the Holy Spirit living there, you will cause division around the people that you interact with. I don't want to be in a church with a homosexual bishop. I don't want to be in a church with a female pastor. I want to be in a church where they systematically teach the Word of God. That's where I want to be. If I need worldly advice, I will go to Golden Hibachi and I'll get a fortune cookie and I'll open it up and get something from that. I don't need that. Christians, we're not going to see peace on earth until sin is completely eradicated. We're like the undercover agents that go out with the gospel and we share it with people around us so that people can be reconciled unto God, so that they come on the same team, so that they're fighting for the same thing together. And until that happens, they are at odds with you. If you're a light of the world and they're darkness, one has to break up the other and we know that the light's going to win. Jesus said very specifically that he is the prince of peace. And Israel expected him to show up and usher in peace, overthrow the Roman government, but they didn't see that happen. Because first, he had to come and live a perfect sinless life, die on a cross so that you and I could have salvation and have peace in our hearts so that he could make a people of peace, make a new kingdom of peace, bring people together under one vote, one right, which is Jesus Christ himself. It had to happen that way. There's no permanent peace in this world until there's no sin. And I believe we're getting a lot closer to that, a lot quicker than we think. Jesus knew that for some, following him would definitely bring peace, and for others it wouldn't. And in verses 52 and 53, he introduced the unimaginable to those listening. He said, for from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, two against three. Father will be divided against son, son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. If you wanted to terrify the people of Israel, what you would do is you would start talking about families being divided. Because their families encompass full villages sometimes. And sometimes they had so much family that it would extend out to another city so that they would go there and they would just park and they'd be there for months. How would you like it if one of your relatives showed up at your house and they stayed there for a couple months? You'd clean out the shed. Guarantee it. Folks, but I'm telling you, these people were terrified of what Jesus was saying. He said, but if you love me, blood relatives aren't going to mean what they mean because I'm the real family. Do you remember what happened when his mother and brothers came up to him? And he's got a big crowd around him that's teaching him. They say, Rabbi, they're trying to get up to you. Your mama's over there. Your brothers, he said, you're my real family if you're obedient to me. That was shocking, but it's the reality. It's the eternal reality. If you're in Christ, we're family. That never changes. And you've got to be able to walk away from blood relations. Even to this day, that's the hardest thing a lot of you are going to hear. Isn't it? Isn't it? Some of you will share Christ and it's going to cause division in the family. It's going to cause you to be separated from them because you're doing what's right. But I'm not representing a Christ today that isn't pictured on the pages of Scripture. He is. I'm just preaching what He said. I'm just following in the footsteps of Jesus. How many of you know family members that claim Christ? They don't really follow Him. 
How many of you have relatives that you know are lost? And if you went and shared with them right now, that would just split it wide open. You said, well, I'm just not willing to do that. Folks, when are they going to die? Tell me. You can't answer that question because you don't know and I don't know. So we've got to get the good news as quickly to them as possible. We've got to tell them what they need to hear now because we are not promised tomorrow. Somebody's going to say, well, we just got to build that relationship. That is the biggest load of horse bucky I have ever heard. As we will take years, I'm just building the relationship. I'm just building it. And they go to die and we say, you know, I hope they knew Jesus. I've been in this situation in the past week. I don't tell you to do something that I haven't done myself. I don't know what's going to end up happening, but if you're a follower of Christ, you're watching and you're working until he comes and you're sharing the gospel. This is realigning our church with the central focus that God created it for. He said, Israel, I'm going to set you up and you're going to be missionaries out into the world. And when they didn't do what they needed to do, he brings in the church right after them. And the church is supposed to be the light of the world. We need to be the ones sharing the gospel with people right now that haven't heard the truth. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to be a divisive person? Because right now, I'm telling you to do something that our society is screaming against, aren't they? Just tolerate them. Just live around them. Folks, we had a great discussion yesterday morning with men's ministry. And at men's ministry, we were talking about what we needed to do as men, which boiled down to us being rooted in the gospel and sharing that with people around us. Isn't that the greatest first day of men's ministry devotion we could have had? I was so stoked about that because that's where we have to be as a church today. We have to be about the gospel. We've got to be about sharing Christ with the people around us. And when we get moved off center by the world and they say to you, just be nice to them. You say, I would rather live a divisive life with the people around me than have them go to hell and have never heard the truth. I know that as I'm saying this today, some of you are like, I, I'm just, I, I, just I, I don't like that confrontation. Let me tell you a secret. Your pastor does not like confrontation. I don't like it. There's not a person in this room that truly likes confrontation. You don't like it. On some level, you don't want it. But folks, if you're going to be a messenger of the truth, then this is what you're supposed to do. Amen? Okay. All right, so here's the invitation today. If you're a person in here and you say, you know what, I haven't been willing to share the gospel with the people around us, here's what you do. You repent of your sin because it's sin. You know the right thing to do and you don't do it, it's sin. That's what James says. So you repent of your sin and you get ready to share with whoever you need to the next week. Whoever you come in contact with where God opens the door, you share with them. Okay? If you already know Christ and you've been doing what he asked, rejoice in him. If you need to talk to me, you're more than willing. I'm more than willing to talk with you about it. If you need to get an envelope up here because it's your worship to him in a monetary setting, you go ahead and do it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. I ask that your word would seep into the hearts of the people. Uh, I ask that only what's of you would stay. And uh, Lord, you would use this message to impact lives as only you can. Father, I don't know what you're going to use and what you're not, but I do know that your word will not return void. Thank you for sending the Spirit and giving us this time together today. Ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.